Okay, welcome everyone. Um, this is the keynote session um, uh, where Bradley Kuhn of the Software Freedom Conservancy is going to tell us about uh, why, even though he is a command line geek, um, he thinks that we should use Gnome. <laughs> well, more importantly, what I want to talk about is why everybody should be using Gnome, even though I don't. Um, because I admit that I don't use Gnome, but uh, everybody else should be. Um, and I'm from a, a generation of programmers. Uh, there's a few in the audience from my generation, but not too many. Uh, I, I th sort of think of this masochistic way of looking at programming. By the way, I, I tend to say programmer still. Most people take that as an insult, I think. Uh, you know, my, my dad's generation of programmers, they all called themselves that. Uh, most people, I guess, prefer to be called developers. Uh, I use that word some, but I still think of us as programmers. And I think there's this sense for programmers that if something is really hard to do, that that creates a certain good experience and makes you a more experienced uh, developer. And it creates bonds in a community. When something was really hard to solve, really difficult to do, people are excited about their success and being able to do it. And in fact, this historically, I think, extended into the use of software. It was, uh, so I have this quote here about, you know, oh, well, it's, uh, don't comment. It's, if it's hard to write, it should be hard to understand. This also kind of extended in programming to users. Like, if, if you write software, it was really hard to write, why shouldn't it be hard to use? It should be as hard to use as it was to write, uh, of course. I put all this time in, whoever wants to use it wants to. And there are still software systems out there like this. I recently used a system uh, written by an academic to do a particular job related to GPL enforcement, and uh, it was a very hard software system to use, and I had this kind of excitement when I finally got it working. It was a very good piece of software. Its interface was poor, it was confusing, and it could, I couldn't even get it to build from source uh, uh, very easily. It took me half a day to do just that part. Uh, but once I got it working, I, was, I, I felt like, wow, I've accomplished something. I got this piece of software that was so difficult to use to work, and now I can use it. Um, and I, I think everybody tends to like it when they get an invitation to a secret club. And being able to use software that's hard to use or being able to write software that's hard to write is, is kind of a, a secret club that we can be in together. And being able to show you could overcome some adversity and, and, and succeed in overcoming that adversity, it's something I think generally to be proud of. And so this concept has bled over the generations really into the way software developers think uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, and this occurs in other parts of society. This is a kind of a US-centric thing. I don't know if people say this saying outside of the US, but the joke is an older person will say, you know, in my day, we had to walk uphill both ways in the snow to get to school. Um, so they all lived in places like this, so, so that it was uphill both ways. They had to climb a mountain to go to school every day. Um, so, so the sense of things were tougher for Therefore, you have to pay your dues, and it should be tougher for, as tough for you as they were for us. I, I think it's a very human thing. You, you, I mean, I certainly have this, um, so I will offend much of the crowd here. I, I have this kind of reaction to the millennial mindset of that generation. I feel like, well, you know, millennials have it much easier than I did, you know, and they live in a much easier world and, and don't have the kind of challenges we had in our generation. So I think, I think every group of people, when they look at another group, they say, well, they don't have it as difficult as we do. Also, I think software authors, people who started writing software in the beginning, were generally supporting a user base that were much like themselves. Uh, there's a re reason why these things are called computers. They were first used to compute scientific computations. Uh, they don't actually need to be called computers. If you think about it, why, why did we call them that necessarily? It's because the first jobs that people tried to do with a general purpose computer was to compute a function or compute some scientific uh, outcome. And so scientists were the first users of computers. And it turns out there's a lot in common between a scientist in any given field, physics or so forth, with people who tend to work in computing. So the users and the developers of early software were very culturally similar. They come from the same kind of world. Now, eventually, we get to a time when there are other people using software, people who aren't scientists, people who don't come necessarily from a science background. My first job in 1991, that was actually a place somewhat of science. I worked at a blood typing laboratory on software. And in the data processing department, 
uh, which is what they called it in those days, uh, there was this sign that some, one of the users had put up on the wall. This was kind of the reaction to computing that people who relied on computers to get their job done had to us. And I, I, I looked at the sign and sort of felt like, well, hey, I'm supposed to be making these computers work and do the right thing, and they're just basically telling me, well, you're just going to screw everything up for us. Um, so it's, it's this kind of thing, cultural disconnect that came into existence between people who rely on technology to get their job done, uh, jobs done and the people who create the technology, um, as if there's some sort of arms race between the two groups. And I think there's a, that culture in a lot of places. And in fact, this whole idea of, of something called a user, um, I've always been kind of uh, intrigued by that word. The, uh, the most common usage, at least in the US, uh, for in English is to say that somebody's a drug user, which means they abuse some substance. Uh, and that's where you hear the word mo most often uh, outside of software. You also hear it sometimes as someone who tries to manipulate you. Oh, oh that person, she, she or he is just a user. They use other people. They manipulate them to get them to do what they want. So these two uses of that word, um, that connotation kind of gets read into how I think in some contexts developers and technologists perceive the people who are going to use these things. So this guy, uh, this computer scientist named Don Norman, um, has been on a campaign to end the use Oh, of I have great work. confidence now because I have in front of this confidence monitor. <clears throat> uh, Don found out. So uh, we're going to be looking at a monitor that's in front of us so we don't have to crane our necks. Uh, and Don found out that this is referred to in the biz as a confidence monitor. You no, know, um, I think the words that we use make a real difference. It really changes the way we think about it. For example, one of the horrible words we use is users. I, I am on a crusade to get rid of the word users. I would prefer to call them people. People? Mm. You know, we test people. What a strange thing. We, we design for people. We don't design for users. Uh, earlier in this business, we used to call things that we did, we were idiot-proofing it or fool-proofing it. And you still hear those terms, right? And that means you have great confidence in, in, in the people you're designing confidence. for. Confidence. So that the notion that I was told this is called a confidence monitor, that means that the conference organizers, those professionals, have absolutely no confidence in us, right? They don't think much of us. So um, I, I think we should have confidence in people, right? And so I have my confidence monitor here myself that I you know, fashioned my own way. Um, but I, I think th this idea that, that, that we create that kind of relationship uh, with people who use technology and that there's some sort of distinction, I think that that's a certain arrogance that we, we should get rid of. I think it stems from a fear of failure. Uh, at least it does in me, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. I think people are generally most comfortable when they can work on things that solve problems they understand and that they have every day. Uh, it's also very much easier to succeed. If you work on problems to satisfy your own needs and what you think you need in the world, it, you can succeed more often and you can feel like you're, you're doing something. And in fact, developers who loved computers initially, the earliest computers, well, they mostly spent their careers writing software and creating software for other developers. Think about how many projects we have in our communities that are projects for other developers. There's an, actually an obsession in our field of writing new tools for developers. There's always people working on them. And, and that's not to say that we don't get a lot better tools, right? Distributed version control is much better than what we had before. But look at the interfaces to it. Uh, I sit down in front of Git now and use it every day, and the commands are really not that different from the RCS commands that I used in the late 1980s. Right? We have the same user interface, roughly, to our stuff, and most of us kind of like that user interface. I, I kind of like it. But the, the mindset of serving uh, 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 this kind of introspective way of doing software development, prioritizing people who are developers over users, it's something that I fall to as well. I think all of us do, and we're afraid. It's harder to create software for somebody you don't understand as well. You're more likely to fail. And this is part of the reason I hate graphical user interfaces. I've written three GUI programs in my life. All of them were school projects. Um, I don't think I'll ever try to write a GUI program again. I got reasonably good grades on the three that I wrote in my life, but I was never good at it. And I don't think I have the skill to be a good uh, graphical user interface developer. I, I, I could never do it. I couldn't do what most of you do every day. And 
I think it's a special skill to be able to write software that works for what I'm going to call here normal people, people who aren't computer geeks, people who don't love sitting in front of a computer all day long, like most of us do. And so I'm really impressed that there are people who can write these things, because I can't. Um, and the other thing is, is that there's a real resistance by everybody about change. I think most people don't like changes, at least in my experience, unless you're the person who came up with the idea for the change. Obviously, you always like your own think of, but when somebody else proposes a change, I think most people have an immediate reaction to be like, well, I'd rather, I'd rather not change. And if you're someone who tries to be an agent of change in the world, you're trying to get changes to occur and happen, there's kind of a, a dual thing that's going on. In, in one part, you have a burden to really convince people the change is valuable and work towards it, even if people disagree with you and so forth. But there's also an incredible power, especially if you're a person who's successful in introducing change into the world, because you now have a power to shape the future. If you're a person who can succeed at making big changes in the world. And what I found is the people who are the best agents of change, first of all, they seek changes that relinquish power rather than take more of it. So people who can say, I want to use this power I have to convince change in the world so that my power to influence is diminished over time rather than increased. Uh, there are obviously megalomaniacs who do the opposite. Um, the other thing is I find people who are agents of change that can really successfully convince people that just over this rocky road of change, there's a really great thing just past the horizon that we're all going to get to together. Um, and I have a personal experience about this. Um, so I'm going to do a, a couple of my slides in German just because I took German in school. And I, I remember distinctly uh, that in like one, you know, when you're a kid and they give you the first language books, right? I remember this, das ist der Jan, er hat eine Brille. Right? So I remember this picture of this guy, Jan, having glasses. So there's me. Um, I, have, I have glasses. I, the other thing is weird is that in, in English, we, we, this is plural, but it's one thing. Right? So German's a little smarter about this. It's a singular word, right? Because I, I, if it's in two parts, you have a problem, right? Um, so I, I had the same pair of glasses since 2003. This is a picture from circa 2007. I couldn't find an older one, but I assure you, these are the same glasses I went to the optician and got in 2003. Here I am at 2010 at Guadic. That's the same pair of glasses that I was wearing in 2003 and 2008. I had the same pair. Here I am earlier this year at LCA. That is the same pair of glasses that I had since 2003. They are now 13 years old in this photo um, at that point. And um, there's a secret about myself I'm going to reveal. Um, I've been walking around with broken glasses for the last year and a half, uh, until now, actually. Uh, if you look, I'm actually really glad. Uh, uh, Nate was just telling me that he's the only one of LWN who carries a high-quality camera. I'm glad he wasn't there, because if you look really closely, that's electrical tape. <laughs> holding my glasses together. Now, I can't tell if everybody in the free software community has been too polite for the last year and a half to point out that I was walking around in glo broken glasses or not, but it was, in fact, in two pieces. Um, I, 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 in fact, on my checklist of travel, I just noticed I now no longer have to have, make sure you have extra electrical tape in case the glass the, it falls apart while you're traveling. Um, so what happened was, last week, the other side broke. So then I had electrical tape on both sides. And I realized I couldn't come here and give this keynote with electrical tape on both sides of my glasses because I'm sure someone would notice. So after 13 years, because I hate change, you see, I had to give in and go to an optician and actually get new glasses. Now, a couple of things are true about these. Um, the viewing area is a lot bigger than the ones you saw in the other picture, right? which I like because it helps my peripheral vision is much better. And there's no denying that these are substantially lighter. Now, the other ones were titanium too, but these are lighter than the other ones. Um, but they're driving me nuts. Okay, it, it, it's, I'm convinced it's pinching my nose. I'm convinced it's like hitting the back of my ear. Um, I, if you saw me sitting in the back during one of the talks earlier, I kept taking them off, right? And, and so I, I went into Tuesday, right, before I came here to talk to the optician, and, and she was very patient. Um, she did various different things. You know what they do, if you, have, if you have glasses, you know this, they go and they take it in the back and you hear noises and they come back and put it on your face and say, well, how's that feel, right? So she did this a few times. Um, and she was very polite, but she finally said, they're going to stop hurting as soon as you stop thinking about the fact that they're hurting. Um, and she's probably right. So a few times, you know, over the past couple of days, I've 
forgotten that I have new glasses now after 13 years. And they do, in fact, stop hurting. So they're not actually digging into my nose. In fact, right before I left, I walked up to my wife and I said, is there a red mark there? And she says, no, there's not a red mark. I'm like, well, okay, so I, it's not, I can't be digging that hard into my ear if there's no red mark, right? So I wonder if we should have gotten this optician to go to Linus and do a fitting of GNOME 3 for him, right? <laughs> to help him feel a little more comfortable uh, in GNOME 3 so that it would stop hurting and maybe wouldn't have had that uh, bad press, right? Um, so I, I think change, my point here, is very difficult for people. And I think what we saw in the GNOME 3 rollout was this reaction people have of, of just this terrible fear of change. Now, I did finally, after 13 years, change, uh, change my, my glasses. I, I'm not going to change my desktop. This is my desktop. I, I opened just a few windows, but uh, all of my windows are one of two things. They are either Emacs or they are Xterms. The stuff in the back is generated by Conky, which is one of the RS most difficult to configure programs I've ever found, but it lets me put these little like things in all these corners that I can look at. So. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to leave my desktop this way. Now, this is not how my, uh, and it works for me. Um, and I actually found that I'm incredibly fast at doing things on the computer. Most of what I do all day is sling text around from various different places. Emacs is admittedly the best tool for that. And since most of my job is changing, editing, and modifying, and repurposing text, it works out pretty well. But all of the software that I use, Xterm and Emacs, which is most of the software that I use, I do use a web browser as well, I admit. Um, it's designed for people who are like me and like computers like I do. And the fact of the matter is most of the people in the world are not like me in a number of different ways. So not only am I this computer geek, I'm also a privileged white guy, right? So it means that when we've developed so much software over the years, we've had this bias towards middle-class privileged white men who like computers, right? And there's just so many cultural biases stacked on top of each other uh, in how computing has been developed over the years. Um, and that's why I like this desktop, right, that I have that I don't want to change. But if we're going to have computing for everybody in the world eventually, certainly everybody in the industrialized world now needs a computer on a daily basis to do normal life tasks, we'll need something different. So my wife's desktop is yours. Um, this Putting on my wife's desktop was basically so I can legally put a picture of my dogs in the, in the um, and that is in fact her desktop, so it's, it's, not, a, it's not doctored. But she runs GNOME 3. Um, she hated it when we installed it. <laughs> um, but when she stopped thinking about, just like my, my glasses, she stopped thinking about what it hurt and it just didn't hurt anymore. And she's used to it and likes it and is fine with it, has no problem. Um, of course, I use my wife's computer this way, if I have to use it. Um, and, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't necessarily need GNOME, and in fact, uh, I only open a terminal and do something on her computer for her when she needs me to do something on her computer for her. Um, and besides, I use, still use Xterm. In fact, I think I might be the last Xterm user in the world, I'm not sure, but I don't use GNOME, I actually use real, good old Xterm, which by the way supports UTF-8, which kind of surprises me on a daily basis, uh, but it does. Um, so so I, I, my point is, is that there are different people in this world that need the kind of software that you're developing, and it's really important. So I remember this, I, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing you. I don't remember if this is exactly what you said in 2003. You might not remember either. Um, but this seems absolutely right to me. It seems more right to me than it did way back then. I'll wait for Jonathan to take a picture before I switch slides. Um, but it, it, we need this thing, right? We need it because we need desktops for everybody. And from my point of view, GNOME is the best way that we're going to get there. Now, I haven't mentioned my favorite topic the whole time to talk about software freedom, which is what I'm all crazy about and so forth. And I've gotten halfway through a talk and haven't mentioned the GPL, by the way. I'm actually going to get to the end before I mention the GPL. It's pretty rare for me, right? Sorry, sorry, Hap? What was the one? Oh, I guess I did, OK. <laughs> I, I mentioned the GPL to say I hadn't mentioned the GPL. Um, so computing should be for everyone. And I think everyone deserves software freedom. That I believe that software freedom should be universal. And I've often said that I felt software freedom is really most useful to developers, to programmers, because it's certainly true that the freedom to modify is not that useful. My wife always tells me, 
uh, the proprietary software and free software is the same to her because she doesn't know how to modify it anyway. And now there's all these arguments out there that say, well, then you can hire anybody you want to modify it, and there's, you know, there's more people viewing it for security. There's all the other arguments. But the one that's actually most compelling to me about why software freedom has to be universal is that it will find the next generation of developers who are not like us, who are not privileged middle-class white guys, right? Because we middle-class privileged white guys who got into software development often did so because we tinkered, because we got devices early and young, right? It was rare to have a computer when I was a kid, but I was a privileged kid who got to have one, which is what turned me into a computer geek, right? So if we have computing devices that are all proprietary software, there won't be the opportunity for anybody to tinker, which means there won't be a system that finds who the great new developers and technologists are because there won't be that feeder system of curiosity that kids can take their computers apart and see how they work. So I think that's the best argument for why software freedom has to be because we have to find the people that are gonna create the next best thing. And the only way they're gonna be able to do that is that they have access to computers and have access to the source code of those computers and the ability to modify it and to install their modified versions. So we really have to avoid allowing this community to stay heterogeneous by biasing it towards those who are privileged. And I think proprietary software ultimately does that. Now, we beat the former competition, right? Owen and Finn and uh, old school Gnome developers, raise your hand. Who else is here, right? So all of you, like you beat Microsoft, right? You beat them. But this is what you had to beat, honestly. And it wasn't that hard to beat that, to tell you the truth. Um, so it, I don't think Microsoft was ever a user-driven company. Famously, Steve Ballmer shouting, developers, developers, developers is what they cared about. Now, I know that's not exactly what he meant, but there was never really a desire to make things good for people. I don't think Microsoft had that mindset ever in its, in its proprietary history. Um, and therefore, I think while it was a time-consuming task to beat Microsoft on the desktop, I think GNOME did it because it was admittedly a relatively easy task and you were able to pull it off with given enough time. But that's not the threat anymore. So I showed you that picture of me from Guadalc 2010 in The Hague. Uh, and, I, and I was also at Guadalc uh, 4, which was in Dublin as well. And a few months after that, I went to Linux World. And it's, it's for those of you that were, the, the few around in the old days, raised there, those of you that were, it was a big industrial trade show type thing. Um, th this was a moment in history where we thought that GNU Linux was going to be as big as all the other things. Uh, and I mean, IDG, which runs the Star World Conferences, thought so too. They were dumping huge amounts of money and uh, companies were coming to the big trade show floor. You know, it was looking like a Comdex type scenario or a burgeoning one. And I remember being on the escalator going down into the Moscone Center uh, just a few months later. And I heard two, two, I don't think they knew who I was. They didn't know, at that point, I was executive director of the FSF. I think they had no idea who I was. They're standing behind me on the escalator. And one says to the other, yeah, I, I don't, I'm, I'm going to get rid of this Linux laptop. I'm going to get a Mac. Right? And it, it really disturbed me at the time. And I thought, I think we're in trouble. I think we're in trouble because we've been fighting the wrong enemy. Everybody's been obsessed with, well, we've got to beat Microsoft on the desktop. What about Mac? We haven't even thought about it. We haven't, it's not on our radar screen in 2003. Uh, Apple was kind of a joke still in 2003. People still made Newton jokes in those days. Um, now, meanwhile, there's this advent of other devices. I don't want to name who this was because uh, I don't want to embarrass them, but I sat down with someone who was a former member of the GNOME community and who writes a server application you know, the, the, on, on GNU Linux. Uh, that's as, as specific as I'll get. And I had lunch with them, and both of them said, this is five years ago now, on five years, there just won't be keyboards anymore. Everybody just wants, they're going to be on their phones, they're going to be on tablets, there won't be keyboards. The keyboards are gone away, everybody just wants tablets now, and so forth. And they were a little bit right, because I, I looked up some of the stats, at least for the US, on regular computer styles. I think this is desktops and laptops together. So it dropped from 93 million per year to 71.25 million per year in 2015. The last year, I, could, I couldn't find numbers, obviously, for this year yet. But that's a lot of computers 
71.5 new computers, laptops or desktops, sold in 2015. Now, the problem is Apple is taking that market over. Uh, in fact, I found other stats when I was looking last night that Apple is starting to beat one by one on the list such that we're getting where multiple laptop makers don't match Apple's sales on laptops. And we will have to chase that fight for a couple of reasons. The Apple platforms are more locked down, more proprietary, less friendly to software freedom than anything we ever saw from Microsoft uh, in the history of our fight against proprietary software. I've met a lot of free software geeks who like Macs. The entire, you go to OzCon now, like I see, you know, I see three Apple, like little Apple shining back right now. I know David's actually not running Mac OS, so that's one less, right? But uh, technically speaking, he's just using the hardware. But if you go to an OzCon, it, uh, I, somebody told me once, I said, oh, I'm speaking at OzCon, they said, don't let the glow of the apples from the audience make you fall over, right? Because it's just wall to wall, everybody runs Mac, right? They're open source people, but what they want on their desktop is Macintosh. And it's clear that someone will dominate this market. This market for laptops is not going away. It needs to be free software. That's the next job, I think, that we have to do. That's who we have to fight. If there's a big enemy, like Microsoft was the big enemy in the 90s, it's Apple. The fact of the matter is we're not going to reach universal software freedom in our lifetimes. I came to this conclusion about uh, probably about 15 years ago. I realized, wait a second, I'm actually going to die in a world with proprietary software in it. I was under the delusion in my early 20s that we would live, I would live long enough to see software freedom win. I don't think I will. I don't think anybody in this room will. So it's not actually about winning. It's not actually about, well, we're going to get a free software desktop to everybody, and then we'll win, and everybody will be running free software desktops. We, we'll never see that day. So we don't actually need the, 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 the secret year of the Linux desktop that we were promised every year, right? As long as we have a year of, there are more people using free software des desktops than there were last year by a small margin, that's really success for us because we haven't gone away, right? That's what's happening now with software freedom. We're under threat of just not having it at all. So keeping the torch alive enough that it's still in the game is success. I know it doesn't feel like success. I just think we've thought about this all wrong. It's okay to play to stalemate. We played to stalemate on servers and it's not so bad. There are problems in the server market, but most of them are free software systems. Uh, and we succeeded there. It's kind of a stalemate because most of the applications are proprietary and this whole platform as a service, infrastructure service is as much a threat as proprietary software ever was. But the platform they're all building on is a Linux-based platform. So we're at a stalemate situation there. We just need the same stalemate on the desktop too, from my point of view. I know it's painful to pursue something you believe is morally right when it feels like the odds are really against you. I've felt for a number of years that the odds are kind of against software freedom, and it concerns me. But I think we still have a chance. We just have tough opponents. There's a lot of smart people working for Apple. They want to make things proprietary. Uh, they want the world to be the change that they control, right? Apple is a, has been a huge power for change in the world, right? It's changed technology a lot. But remember how I was talking about this thing of, well, change has a certain power to it, right? I think the Steve Jobs mentality, which is now the Apple mentality in his death, is we will change the world to control it, right? We will, we will tell people what they want and they will love it because we'll make things so wonderful for them. We know better how to make things wonderful to them than they know for themselves. Uh, that's kind of scary. The great thing is that GNOME 3 did something special. It tried something different that was successful. It is a different type of interface than what other people had before. And it's a good interface. I see people liking it. I see people when they get over the hump of it's different, really do like it. So it's a huge success. And you should remember that you've had a huge success. I, I know it didn't look like a success because of the way it was reacted to, but it was. And there, it, it is growing and will continue to grow if you keep working on it. You're as much wizards as all those Apple people are, and you can do this. And you have to do this for all of us. I'm asking you to. 
Those of you that are around for a long time will remember a, a former Apple guy showed up in our community for a while and did some cool things. So Andy Hertzfeld was the, one of the original developers of the Mac operating system. And for about five years, he was kind of a free software guy. He started this company with VC funding called Easel, and the early Nautilus development, most of you probably know, was funded by Easel. Now, I'm not a fan of using VC startup money to try to get things going. We saw ultimately what happened to Easel, but the code was out there under the GPL, and it was a good thing for us. Andy, whom I got to know during those five years, he was hanging around the free software community. Uh, he did a couple of fundraisers for the Free Software Foundation and other things. He was really intrigued by what was happening in free software. So he's one of the key historical figures in proprietary user interface design. And he came to our community and said, wow, this is interesting enough that I want to try to do something here. And now, it was only a partial, uh, sort of somewhat of a success, but ultimately failed. But it made a difference while it was happening. And there will be more that show up. We will have more, and I'm sorry I think about these terms in this kind of almost Cold War mentality, but we'll have more defectors. We'll have more people from the proprietary world to come and say, what you're doing here is really interesting. I'm going to switch. I'm going to come over here. It will happen more and more. So I give a lot of talks, uh, and you, you can probably find them online if you want to read them uh, or see them, rather, uh, about the whole idea of co-option. Open source has been this kind of co-option of the principles of software freedom. And there is actually a tremendous amount of fi financial pressure to get developers to s work on specific types of areas that companies are willing to fund. Right? If you look at the kinds of jobs that free software developers are getting now, it's things like OpenStack and infrastructure as a service type stuff. Right? This idea of funding specific types of open source to, in some sense, avoid funding stuff that they want to keep proprietary is becoming more and more common. Um, and I'm really excited about companies like Endless and so forth, although I did hear in the talk that some of the things are proprietary, but at least they are trying to do something different than what the industry wants to fund right now and something that is more user-focused. We need more of that. We need more people to say, I'm going to try and build the traditional free software business again and get out there and try to do something around GNOME. I hope more of you will. The point I make in these other talks, if you don't want to go watch them, which I don't blame you. You've already listened to me for 30 minutes. You shouldn't have to listen to me for any more if you don't want to. Uh, but what's happening is the incumbent power structure of software industry doesn't really care about this cause of universal software freedom. They are completely happy with kind of a compromised, we have some things that are open source, but most of it's proprietary. Uh, and that's why we're in for a very long fight. And I, 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 this is, you know, I, I told somebody this was going to be a rah-rah GNOME talk. It, it obviously kind of isn't because I'm saying we have a lot of challenges. But I, I think we have to think about what can be done. So I found something out on the plane. Sh Shakira and RMS have something in common other than the length of their hair is about the same. Um, so, I, I, uh, so, so I promised myself that when I got on the plane, I would work on my talk. Um, but I didn't. I decided to watch a movie. And just like much of our systems today, uh, there was in front of me this uh, system running Linux, but of course some bunch of proprietary software on, to uh, on, on top of Linux to do the movie interface uh, on, de on Delta. And so I started scrolling through, and I read this article uh, a couple years ago about crying on planes. Apparently, this is a common phenomenon. They, they, nobody's ever studied it, but it's anecdotally heavily reported that people have a more likelihood of crying at movies on planes. Um, so once I read this, you know, and I, I'd experienced this myself, so once I, I, used, once I just had read this, I, now, ever since then, I, I just go for it, and I look for the most sappiest movie I can find to just sort of you know, you know, induce the, the crying on planes. Um, so I watched Zootopia on the way over here. Um, and so the, the big song in Zootopia has these lyrics. Um, now, I was going to play the video, but I thought that would like, really be way too sappy to actually play the video of the song. So there's the quote. But I, I looked into this, and I thought, this sounds a lot like something RMS wrote a long time ago. Um, this idea that we just have to try and we might fail at what we're doing. We might not actually bring free software to the world. Um, yeah, it's a little bit more trite in Shakira's version, but it's the same sort of thing. We have to try. There, there's no point in not trying because then we definitely fail. We can try to make a world that has all software freedom and we'll succeed sometimes. We're going to fail other times. Uh, my view really is we're going to play to stalemate a lot over the next 20 years. 
but we have to keep doing it. We have to make sure that there's a free software alternative there, even if we're in a, a huge minority, even if that, you know, we're, we're fighting over this tiny little market space uh, that's, you know, 1% you know, of the market or whatever it is. I don't even know what the percentage of the market free software desktops are. But we've made a difference already in a lot of people's lives. Um, there are many, many people whose lives are better because of the work that you've done. Um, and I hope that you'll keep doing it. I, I, I know that it will not be easy. Uh, it's hard to fund free software. It's hard to, to do the work. It's more, excuse me, more complicated to work in large communities where you have to collaborate. I think we get a better result for it, uh, but it's, it's harder fought. Uh, and I appreciate all of you doing it, and I hope you will keep doing it. I'd like to tell you to use another movie I watched on a plane and cried at. I would wish I could tell you everything is awesome. It's not. It's, it's, everything's going to be tough. It's going to be a struggle. And it's not going to be easy to get the free software. I realize I, yeah, this is my second made of easy joke. Um, but I, I think that we need a good GPL, copy-lefted free software desktop for, the, for software freedom to succeed. It's an essential component to the work that I'm doing in the more general world of software freedom. Without GNOME, there's a, miss, there's a big missing piece. So I'm really glad that you're doing it. So just please keep doing what you're doing. Uh, and if you're discouraged, just keep trying if you can. We all need this. I need it and the world needs it. So I thank you all for all the work you're doing and I hope you'll keep doing it. And you let me know if there's anything I can do to help. Thanks. Does anyone have any questions? Hi. Um, I've got a question regarding proprietary software, but proprietary software with a limited lifespan. Uh, I'm thinking specifically about games, content, something that you can, uh, that you consume very much like you would a film. So I, I do understand in terms of preserving those games because they are important in a, in a lot of people's culture. Uh, you know, the games that we used to play when we grew up and that sort of thing. We need to be able to keep them. So I'm, I'm really against uh, DRM in games. But what about proprietary games and, and you know, something that you consume rather than can evolve upon, like something that you would iterate uh, and make better. You know, I'm not talking about uh, solitaire. I'm talking about triple A games. What, what, what's your take on, on that particular type of software? So I, I, I think it, it goes back to the point I was making about how we get young people engaged, how we find the next generation of developers, ones who want to tinker, right? The, the typical way that young people get introduced to software is games, quite, quite often. That's certainly how I was introduced uh, to games. And, and now the games I played on the Commodore 64 were proprietary software, but not really, because they were in, uh, they were in 6802 Assembler, uh, and I used a binary editor to change the games that I played all the time. Uh, and you know, put my own name in them, all the sort of things you can do uh, if you have the assembly code and it was written in assembly the first time. Um, so I actually really believe it's important we have free software game engines. Uh, I, I look at what uh, Conservancy Project Godot has been doing lately. They've been getting so much interest. Uh, there's this new game engine that the, a couple of developers got together and started writing. Um, and there's a lot of excitement about it. It's, it, it. People get excited about writing game software much more than they get excited about you know, writing uh, office software. It's just a fact. Um, now, you mentioned the, the issues of, of the licensing of other parts of it. Um, personally, I'm a supporter of the free culture movement. I think the, the monetary ways that works out is very different than software. Um, so I, un, I don't claim to be an expert in how you build a business model with free culture licensing. But I would really love to see games that are uh, under GPL and then have CC by SA uh, licensing for the cultural components, you know, the, the video parts, the, the, you know, the audio parts, and so forth. Um, I think we'll, we need that. Whether 
whether I were, I always used to say when I get asked, when we used to get asked this question, I'd say, if, if I lived in a world where all software were free software except for games, would I, would I spend my life on software freedom? I, I used to say, absolutely not. I say, I'm not sure now. Um, I, I, I certainly see the value in making sure people can modify their games because people get excited about that. And that's what gets people involved in software development, how people learn. So I, I kind of feel like that's, that's an important thing we should have um, for getting young people in, excited about developing software. So, so I, I think games have to be free software too, <laughs> is basically the long and short of it. Now, the, the one uh, while we're looking for, somebody else put their hand up and I'll, I'll add one more point, which is um, I think most of the market would happily buy the game anyway, right? Even if it was free software. If you just marketed it like any other game and it happened to be GPL'd, um, the number of people that would buy it might be slightly less, but I don't think it would be so much less that you couldn't use the same funding models that the games currently do. Um, I, I'm guessing. I, I'm, I, I mean, I, hey, I'm a, I'm a nonprofit free software activist, so I don't know how to make money at anything um, necessarily. <laughs> but um, but what I do know is that certain that, that you can never prioritize making money over doing what's right. And so and so I always try to find what's right first, and then say, well, let's figure out how to make money doing what's right. Any more questions? Anybody just want to give me a hard time about anything? Usually somebody wants to give me a hard time about something I said. I guess I, I, guess I said too many positive things about everybody, about, about Gnome. Now nobody wants to give me a hard time. Um, it, it, this is really a question, or like a follow-up. Um, there are games, um, well, the ID software modeling, which when, whenever an engine gets too old, they GPL it without mm -hmm. the content. So um, I, I just wanted to say, like, there are games that are built on top of these engines, and basically the content is trade market, so you cannot distribute mm -hmm. it. But the actual software is, uh, so other people can build their own mods or games on top mm -hmm. of the yeah. logic part of it, and and that's one model might work from from the commercial perspective. Right? Yeah, I, but, I, but I think we do need uh, content that's freely modifiable as well, and and so and so that 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 sort of. It throws free culture under the bus, uh, and that that concerns me. That that model concerns me. Yeah, but there's reason. there's the goal, and there's how you get there, right? So if like you don't necessarily need to uh, blow the whole current AAA game um, mm -hmm. uh, business model by trying to encourage like um, uh, free soft, you know, uh, uh, making the engines available as GPL mm -hmm. or. Yeah, I, I see your point. Uh, the, re the reason I'm so hesitant to say, yeah, that sounds fine to me is because I, I've watched so often where the free culture movement happily throws free software under the bus and says, oh, well, as long as we have you know, the, the what we want from free culture, it doesn't matter if the software is free or proprietary. And I'm not inclined to do that on the other side. I, I try to, uh, most free culture people would say it's important for that content to be under a CC BY or CC BY SA license. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stick with the free culture movement on that just just because they don't they don't often stick with us, so I feel like I, I want to be the better the better person um, and say that yes, it needs to be free software and it has to be free culture too. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I think that that a step forward is always a step forward as well. There's there's everything's relative. So something is worse. There's always something worse, and there's always something better. The final question is not about games. <laughs> So yeah, I love free software, and I guess we we all do. But I'm also uh, a pacifist, and uh, we all uh, all we have uh, GT, uh, code in GTK or uh, uh, code in GNOME, and we can be quite sure that uh, some of our code is running on maybe some aircraft carrier, and is used by the military, for example. And how can we get uh, young people, young people who uh, don't want this further militarization of software, which we have in the drone warfare and uh, mm -hmm. there. Uh, how is this possible to prevent this stuff and also have the zero software freedom to run any software for any purpose? I have quite a problem with. Yeah, I do, I do a little bit too, right? And so I've thought a lot about how to reconcile that issue. I, um, I'm a this as well, um, and uh, I'm also a vegetarian, and so you know I'm sure that there's lots of free software uh, running butcher shops uh, uh, and all that sort of thing, which would bother me as well. Um, I, I think the problem we come into is is if you start saying there are certain 
uh, issues that we want to try and push forward at the same time. Uh, and then basically everyone comes with their, their pet issue and says, well, that, that, no, I don't want free software use for that. I don't want free software use for that. We have a gr very difficult time getting consensus. Um, so I've generally always felt that the software is kind of, is just, is just a, a, doesn't do anything in the sense that it doesn't do wrong or right. It's what the people do with it. Right. So from my point of view, if the military is going to use software anyway, there's one of two ways it can go. They can pay a proprietary software company and develop new software, which financially that would cost them some money and maybe there would be less budget. But would that really work it out such that they weren't doing drones, right? No, they would just get a proprietary software company to write a drone operating system. Suppose that you suppose GPL had a clause that said no military use, right? They would just write their own operating system. We'd still have drones. So I'm, I'm disinclined to believe a strategy that putting into licenses would work. And when you start saying, well, everybody's pet issue has to be put in there, uh, then free software doesn't work at all because then someone is always going to disagree with you about something. So I see it more as this consensus thing of we have to have consensus about something. And the only thing that's easy to get consensus about is freedom zero, their freedom to use software for any purpose. Um, Stallman would probably have a different argument. He'd probably say something about how there, there's a, you know, that there's the, the freedom to swing your arms on the tip of my nose or something like that. Um, I, I don't know if I've ever agreed with his arguments for why freedom zero is some sort of moral imperative. I see it as a consensus issue. Does that make sense? It's, I mean, we, we, we can't all agree on every, every issue. It's hard enough to agree on the four freedoms, right? I mean, so, so if we start trying to modify them, I think, I think we, we get into worse territory. And there's also the other thing that there are um, lots of things that have actually come from the military, including the internet and Tor. And these are originally military projects, but we have taken them and used them for good. Yeah, I mean, I mean cer certainly that's true. I mean, this is one of the reasons why I think copyleft is essential, because even if you're, you're at your political enemy, um, I, to make clear, I'm, not, I'm still a pacifist, is using your software, if you've copyleft it, you can be assured that their improvements are gonna come back to you and come back to the commons. Um, so I think copyleft is kind of an equalizing force as well on that front, that if we make sure everything is copylefted, we can be assured that, well, even if they make some modification to make the drones more dangerous, at least we'll get to see that code and modify it. Uh, so that I think is important. Um, and by the way, I, I'd love to see the, the, the point of view, if, if a Pharaoh GPL code were in a drone, the people you kill with it, wouldn't they have the right to see the source code, at least before they were shot, right? So maybe we should, and I think the military wouldn't touch a Pharaoh GPL for that reason. So maybe you should just switch to the Pharaoh GPL and the military will never touch it anyway. I have a question regarding uh, free hardware. It's just, uh, it's more than, it's uh, kind of uh, bringing up this issue. Uh, many computers here probably are running uh, Intel management, uh, mm -hmm. management engine firmware without being able to disable it. Yeah. So I just want to bring up this issue and ask what do you think about this? Because I think personally without free hardware and without bringing uh, the ease of development free hardware into GNOME community and free software community, the, the whole community is in danger because it's relying heavily on proprietary hardware. Yeah, I mean, my talk was already pessimistic enough. I mean, if I raise this issue too, it just gets worse, right? Um, it, it's a disaster scenario. You're absolutely right. Um, I, we are at the, I mean, I'm running here an X200, which is probably the last model uh, of Lenovo laptops this generation um, that can run 100% free software top to bottom, right? There, there won't be another laptop like this. They're, they're, the Think Penguin guys are working on an ARM-based laptop. Their feeling is, is that they can get closer because basically the, the ARM doesn't have these management engines and so forth. There's problems in the ARM space, but not the same as the Intel space. 
Um, we're getting to the point now where most computing devices uh, are a lot of different computers, right? The, the, C, the CPU is a computer onto itself. The, every single peripheral is actually running its own operating system, its own firmware. Um, so the, the gains that we had where we let, where, you know, say we played to stalemate on the operating system, well, they're, they're kind of attacking us from the bottom as well, right? So there's the top space where application software is generally proprietary. Most phone apps are proprietary, et cetera. But what you're talking about is the attack from the bottom, which is more and more stuff that used to be in a device driver is now in the hardware and proprietary. Uh, and it's software. It's not like it's, it's, it's in silicon. It's just a, it's just a general, a yet another general purpose computer. Uh, and the more general purpose computers we have in each computer, one thing what we think of as a single unit, the worse off it's going to get. It's, it's really bad, and I wish I had a solution. Um, I, I think we have to try, and we might fail, right? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Bradley. Uh, you mentioned one of the important parts of the GPL, uh, perhaps the most part, important part, is that you know, even if your political enemies use it, or people you disagree with, or whatever, they at least have to give their modifications back. So you at least get something back out of it. Uh, but with the GPL, they, they don't if they're not distributing the software. If they're using it internally, there is no requirement for them to distribute their changes. Um, this is, why, this is why I mentioned we should make sure that the drones have to have a Faro GPL code in them, right? Oh, okay. That, right. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is why the Faro GPL exists for that problem, which is that where there's an external user, um, it's not really internal, but it's, it's never actually distributed. Right. But I'm wondering if, if, if we're in a world, I, one of the arguments I've heard for, for this um, is that it's an undue burden to re, you know, require them to uh, release their changes if they're only using it internally. Um, and in a world of distributing software on tape, that was probably very true. In a, a world of complete and total interconnectedness, uh, could we perhaps, or would it make sense for the GPL to require you to distribute changes even if you're doing completely internal use? Um, even if you don't have even external users as in a web service, mm -hmm. but you're just using it completely internally within a company. Is that something that is wise? Almost certainly not enforceable, but... Uh... Well, yeah, the, the enforcement question is the one I always ask first, uh, just because that's what I've spent most of my life doing, so I, I worry, can I actually enforce this clause? Uh, I think you're right that it's probably not particularly enforceable if it were there. Um, and even if it were, there's the problem of the things like hard-coded passwords, right? We don't want people to have to release those, and people hard-code passwords all the time, uh, which they shouldn't do as a technological matter, but people do it anyway. Um, so should, do they have to push that change out every time? Uh, then you get to the question of how often do they have to release? Do they have to do it? How often do they have to do the Git push, right? And if they don't do the Git push every day, did they violate the GPL? And then how would those who use the GPL nefariously in the MySQL kind of business model use that um, as a tool to pressure people to uh, take proprietary licenses? So there's all these unintended consequences when you try to think of it in terms of must give changes back. Um, I, I can't think of a way we could do it that wouldn't have weird side effects. Uh, so I've never thought about proposing it for that reason uh, and, and the unenforceability reason. So I think a fair GPL is the right trade-off. Uh, and and the, the level to which companies are afraid of the fair GPL actually tells me we hit the right mix because companies today are as terrified of the fair GPL as they were of the GPL v2 in, say, 1993, 1994. So I think we must be right at the right mix because probably in three to five years, if there's a code base under the Afero GPL that people really want, like there was under GPL, eventually people will just live with it and start to comply with it instead of just avoiding all Afero GPL code bases. Uh, but we have to start writing some of those. Uh, I mean, I'd mean, be for relicensing all of GNOME under Afero GPL if you want. I'll help you do it. I, I suppose there are probably people in the room who would not like that idea. But... Um, uh, but eventually we can get there. I, I think it'll solve a lot of the problems because most of the scariest times are when there's external deployment. And I'm not totally kidding about the drone example. Um, it does say anyone who interacts with the program. Um, I, I will be interested in learning your thoughts about the whole flat pack initiative. I don't know if you've heard about it and this new way of distributing or building and distributing apps within the GNOME ecosystem? 
Um, I, you know, I, I long time, the, uh, long ago decided I, I shouldn't take it, I shouldn't have opinions on anything technical because I, I don't do enough technical work anymore. Um, so I, I don't have any technical opinions on Flatpak, if that's what you're asking. No, I'm not asking about the technical aspect. Yeah. I'm, I'm more asking about the fact that we're gonna, we're basically pushing for a model in which apps are gonna be detached for the, from the Linux distros and are gonna be distributed and built in a different way. And also, mm -hmm. uh, some will hope that it will also attract the kind of ISVs that don't necessarily do free software. Yeah, I, I mean, this, this has always been the trade-off, right? And this is why GNOME made the decision to put, make the entire uh, library stack under LGPL, right? I, I mean, the, the idea of proprietary applications on GNOME is not one that I enjoy, but it's certainly true that if you're in a situation where you're the huge underdog, um, doing full copy left uh, just sort of guarantees you you fail completely, right? So um, certainly if we've made the decision that, well, the only way we're going to get the platform adopted uh, that's copy lefted is to allow people to have proprietary applications on that platform, it's a trade-off that certainly we've made plenty of times in free software. And glibc could have been GPL'd, for example, and it wasn't. Um, so... Uh, so I, I don't I, I can't say that I like it, right? I mean I, I mean I'm who I am, right? I would never say that, but I, I, it seems a correct tactical decision. Um, the thing I'm worried about is is kind of the Android effect, where you've got an Android system which is ostensibly free software, and there are almost no apps that are free software for Android. I run all three of them, right? I mean, there's more than three of them, but there's three that are actually useful. There, you know, there's K9 and a few others. Um, so so I, 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 I hope there will be a vibrant ecosystem of people developing free software apps to make sure the proprietary apps are the exception rather than the rule. But banning them doesn't seem the right tactical move either. So I think uh, we're pretty much out of time now. So uh, thank you very much, Bradley.